Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hello, everyone. We are again having the honor of hosting Professor Ahmed al-Masri, Professor of Ophthalmology at Alexandria University, Egypt, uh, in the Yadai Academy Zoom meeting, talking again about hot topic. And today's topic is about a very difficult uh, situation when you have a cataract with keratoconus. But the, uh, we, we have to have the meetings, these meetings with the experts to know how. Uh, thank you, Professor Ahmed, for your time and for accepting uh, my second invitation. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for inviting me. It's my honor to be with you in the Ziad Academy. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's our honor and the pleasure to, uh, to know from you today how to deal with a keratoconus, uh, with a cataract surgery in patients with keratoconus, where uh, we have a lot of uh, obstacles in the biometry, in the, in the Q readings, and a lot of uh, obstacles. Please, sir, uh, I, I, you may share your screen. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Just one wise. So. <clears throat> All right, so uh, our topic today about the guidelines for surgical management of cataract in patients with keratoconus, which is um, a point really that we face every day now more and more because we are treating patients with keratoconus more than 10 and 15 years now with the cross-linking and the rings and the other things. And then they started to develop cataract. It's exactly the same era of having the post-lasic cataract since, um, since uh, many years. So as being a sub sub special uh, ophthalmologist in cataract and refractive surgery, especially in keratoconus, it seems to be a hot topic to know what are the guidelines for, these, for the surgical management of cataract in patients with keratoconus. First, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed al-Masri who helped me in the preparation of this presentation. Um, simply, the, these guidelines uh, for surgical management of keratoconus, we have to have three things to put in mind. The age of the patient, the stability of the cornea, and the stage of keratoconus or any ectatic uh, disease in the cornea in general, whether pellucid marginal degeneration, post ectasia, or whatever. As long as the cornea is irregular or ectatic, it should be put under the category of an ectatic cornea and should we deal with the three things, the age and the stability and the stage. The main problem is in the IL calculation, as uh, Dr. Hassam said before, and the refractive outcomes in the ectatic corneas. Usually, our patients, now are, our patients now are highly demanding and they are aiming for getting the least amount of glasses to depend on, even uh, when they are keratoconic or they have keratoconus, um, those patients are still highly demanding. So, we have a few questions to ask first. Is the cornea stable or not stable? It, and this depends on the age of the patient. If the age of the patient is less than 30 years of age and he has keratoconus, it should be stabilized with doing corneal torsinking, linking, which has been approved the main way to hold the progression of keratoconus by fixing the cornea with the riboflavin and the ultraviolet rays. And if the patient is above the age of 30 years, still there is a debate whether to cross-link him or not to cross-link him. Mostly these patients have natural stability as the cornea by age becomes more stable and more stable, and there is no need for cornea cross-linking, and we have to just follow up him by pentacam every six, month, six months. And if there is progression of the keratoconus, corners, we have to fix the cornea before doing anything. So um, um, the fact is stability is a must. We know the signs of progression of keratoconus to know whether it's unstable or stable. The thinning of the cornea more than 10 microns per year means the cornea is unstable and is progressive. If there's increase in the curvature of the K readings by one diopter per year, again, it's another sign of progression of keratoconus. If there is increase in the difference between the superior and the inferior meridia, more than one and a half diopters, again, it's another sign 
of progression of cryptocurrencies, and these are the main three signs of progression. And of course, with the other classification, the ABCD classification of Berlin and the other classification of cryptocurrencies, we can know also the other signs of stability. The second question is the corner regular or not regular? In another meaning, can we depend on the K readings um, uh, for any cornea for accurate bi biometry? The answer is have to make these corneas regular before the cataract surgery. We should do intercorneal ring segments combined with cross linking if there's progressive ectasia. Again, so after corneal stabilities, we have five scenarios to deal with the cataract in these patients. The first scenario mild irregular cornea with Kmax up to 52 diopters. The second scenario is a moderately irregular cornea with Kmax between 52 and 62 diopters. The third scenario is intracornea segments uh, if, the, if the ICRs are not applicable. The fourth scenario, patients with advanced keratoconus. And the last is post-penetrating keratoplastic research. So let's discuss um, um, each scenario separately. Patients with mild irregular cornea with Kmax up to 52 diopters, we should do all the investigations, Pentacam, uh, to know the K readings, optical K readings and ultrasonic biometry are essential. Third and fourth generation formulae, starting from the Hague's L, ending by the Barrett's formula, preferable to do more than two um, formulae to uh, compare between them to be sure that the power of the IOL is correct, or it is within two diopters of the Hagee's L formula, which was the base even for the ref post-refractive surgery, and again, also still the base for the post uh, keratoconus. In a patient like this, who has advanced or moderate keratoconus in the right eye and mild keratoconus in the left eye, um, the cross-linking and the intercoding segments on the um, uh, uh, November 2012, and the uh, maximum cake was uh, K max was 60.5. We did cross linking and rings for the right eye, and we just did cross linking in the left eye. Keep this number in mind and compare it with the next one. It had been improved up to 50, uh, 10 uh, diopters of astigmatism, and it had decreased from 60 to 50, which means that the rings have a very important role in decreasing the astigmatism and regulating the cornea. It is a very important message to the patient to tell him the aim of the rings is not to get rid of your glasses, even for patients with regular keratoconus, not without, even without cataract, to tell him these rings are a way to regulate the irregular cornea and not to get rid of glasses. It's not a lazy procedure. It is just to find the gla glass that we can wear and to see. This is for the patients with the um, keratoconus. For the patients with the cataract, to tell them we have to do this stabilization of the cornea first to regulate the irregular cornea and then wait for three months to do the, uh, uh, the cutter. This patient is a 30 year old patient with, uh, who did uh, cross-linking and after cross-linking, he developed cataract. Astonishingly, in spite of being 30 years of age, he has hard cataract. It seems that riboflavin and um, uh, ultraviolet rays had fixed the lens itself. That's why the lens in a very young age, 30 years of age, which should be done with uh, irrigation aspiration. Now here we use the um, phaco mustification technique and we found that the nucleus is hard. As you see here, we reach with the uh, power and uh, it re the, the CDE reached 3.29, which means that we use a lot of energy and the power was ranging between zero up to 50% with the um, uh, FACO machine, which means that the patients, if they have cross-linking, their lenses could be also cross-linked. And this should be put in mind because now patients with cross-linking have passed more than 10, 15 years and they have cataract now, which could be a little bit earlier than the regular cataract and uh, we may face hard cutters. So we have to wait after cross-linking again, at least six months after cardiac stabilization to depend on the care readings for this patient to do the cataract surgery. This is another uh, patient who had moderate irregular cornea, which was between 52 and 62. And we inserted the rings first and then uh, uh, after three months of inserting the ring, we did the pentacam, optical biometry, and the different um, uh, formulae, including the Hagee's L and the Barrett's formula, um, uh, to depend on the K readings and not before 
um, uh, three to six months and so forth. Um, technically, there is no difficulty in doing the surgery with patients with uh, um, cross-linking and rings or only even the rings, because this patient was old, so we did only rings, we didn't cross-link her um, to regret the cornea. And as you see here, the hydro dissection, the hydro delineation, and the regular steps are easy to be done. There is no obstacle except doing the uh, capsular axis um, in, in the presence of the rings and taking care of the cornea because of the fear of the affection of the endothelium with high powers. This is the same patient with the rings and pseudophagic. One day after surgery, there is no extra surgical skill and the cornea is clear. And the refraction is minus two with minus two astigmatism, which is a reasonable refraction after the surgery all of the time. Another message, keep the patient of keratoconus to the myopic side, don't aim for the emetropia or the hypropia, because these patients all of the time are adapted with the, for the myopic side and the myopic glasses. This is another challenging case of again, young lady in the thirties and she had glaucoma, she had keratoconus, the other eye had keratoplasty. And at the time of intact, as you see here, the ring is large, taking about half the diameter of the cornea and half the diameter of the cornea. And there was another ring that had infection and had been extracted, but still the effect of the extracted intact on the cornea was um, still present. So we did her cataract surgery and in spite, and in spite of having soft cataract, but it took a long time because the visualization of the cornea was difficult and we inserted the lens after that at, at the end of the surgery. The third scenario, if the rings are not applicable due to advanced cataract, it cannot depend on subjective refraction for the rings design uh, from the start, or the patient cannot afford, or the place there is no, um, it's not applicable to have rings. So here we have to make the surgery on steps. If the ICIs are not applicable, first do just cataract without implanting any IOL, especially when you do the lens star or the IOL calculation and to find the numbers are beyond the uh, um, logic numbers. Having a power of IOL minus 17 or minus 15 diopters in a patient who is not very high myope, knowing the axial length, this means that problem mainly is in the cornea. Here, don't depend on this irregular cornea. Just do the cataract, keep the patient affected, and then deal with the uh, situation. After the patient's affected, do a refraction and reassess what he needs. Um, Contact lenses, RGP and hard contact lenses are the best thing to regulate the corneas. And here we can assess the IOL need after putting hard contact lenses for the FAK patients. Or regulate the cornea by ICRs if affordable after doing the cataract surgery. And then you can uh, implant the IOL as a secondary IOL. So if you have high irregular cornea and you cannot regulate it, do the cataract only keep the patient effective and reassess the situation with the refraction of glasses or hard contact lenses or uh, do secondary IOL um, depending on the refraction. The toric IOLs, it's a very debatable uh, subject for patients with ectasia in the cornea or with keratoconus. Toric IOLs do not have good results in very irregular cornea. This is a fact. Even the opposite click corner incisions also does not give uh, predictable results and the fem 2 arc incisions also, they don't give good results. Because all these procedures are based on regular cornea with astigmatism. They are not based on an irregular cornea. So when you do um, um, uh, uh, the surgery, definitely you are not regulating the cornea, you are not dealing with the original um, uh, situation on which the, these procedures are based on but it's an, another situation with an irregular cornea, so preferable not to do the toric IOL or the opposite clear cornea incisions or the femto arc incisions in patients with ectasia and cataract. But still, uh, the toric IOLs in irregular cornea, we have to have highly selected patients with stable, mild to moderate, moderate keratoconus and good vision before the surgeon without any corneal scar 
and the axis of cylinders on topography, keratometry, IL master or lens star should be all of them aligned on the same axis. Here, I can put toric IOLs. Otherwise, this will not be satisfactory for these patients, which are again, highly demanding patients trying to get rid of their astigmatism. The fourth scenario in patients with advanced keratoconus, all of us know, again, the signs of advanced, as we said before, if the patient's cornea is less than 400 microns and the case exceeds the 62 diopters with starting endothelial folds or history of high drops or an opaque apex. In this case, we are only faced with the triple procedure uh, doing uh, deep anterior keratoplasty with FACO and IOL, or if there's high drops, do a uh, penetrating keratoplasty and uh, cataract extraction with interocular lens. Um, this is the fifth scenario for a patient who is post penetrating keratoplasty for a young girl, again, uh, due to contact lens swearing and acanthamoeba infection, and the usual story of fungal infection. Then we did her penetrating keratoplasty. And after one year, um, she developed cataract. So we removed the suture and waited for three months to be ensured that the cornea is regular. Specular microscopy is a must for these patients to know what's the situation of the endothelium with full explanation, explanation uh, of rejection chance because it was a penetrating keratoplasty. And uh, because you, all, of, all of you know that we should tell the patient, you may face rejection of the cornea after the cataract surgery because the affection of the endothelium, which is um, um, definitely is not like the regular endothelium. And of course, we have ways to protect the endothelium like the soft shell technique of Arshinov, putting um, visco cohesive and visco dispersive um, um, uh, visco material behind the cornea and doing very slow phaco uh, emulsification with low power, less than 60%. And the air bubbles that are kept behind the endothelium of the cornea all of the time is a, is, a, is a sign or a clue that there is no ultrasound in the back of the cornea. So these patients, you should be very careful doing your surgery very slow to keep the corneal endothelium. And this is the same patient after one day of surgery, we had a clear cornea and the patient was satisfied due to the measures of taking care of the endothelium. So to conclude, counseling and complete explanation of the situation to the patient. Your surgery is not a regular cataract easy surgery. You have a problem with the cornea, problem in the cornea, and another problem in your lens. We have to solve the problems because to have good results, even when we have it on two steps, as we said before. And adequate preoperative investigation, never ever to be greed to the patient for doing the investigations. Do the Pentacam, do the IOL master. If you are in doubt, send it to another center to do another um, calculation of, uh, of IOL to have consultation on the power of IOL. Do all the formulas, um, more than one formula, uh, the Barrett, the Higgs L, the um, uh, Askers Online, the um, uh, uh, Hills formula, all of these should match or should be more or less near each other to have good result. And all the plans and tools to protect, stabilize and regulate your cornea. Um, use the least ultrasonic power during the surgery because your cornea is compromised. And as we said before, for, for all compromised corneas, whether there is a scar, whether after reflective surgery of any type, of any type or um, after keratoconus, give enough time to judge the final result. Usually these corneas take longer time than the virgin corneas to have their memory back and it may reach up to three months to have the corneal memory, to have the final refraction. So if even after a patient with Blazik, you put your IOL and you found it's plus one with minus two or minus three, you don't hurry to exchange the IOL, no wait for at least three months till the cornea becomes again in its old stage, old state with the corneal memory. So don't panic from having an abnormal uh, refraction or abnormal uh, uh, results immediately after surgery. And don't give any promises to the patient day one or day two. You have to wait and you'll be calm after surgery on compromised cornea. In summary, stabilize the cornea with cross-linking or natural cross-linking after the age of 30. Regulate your cornea by doing the intra ring segments or using hard contact lens to, to see the results. 
may postpone the intraocular lens implantation to a second session if there's a doubt in the power of the IOL. Always target low myopia. Advanced keratoconus do the triple procedure. Toric IOLs are debatable, and don't forget to wait for at least three months to have the final results of the research. Thank you so much for your listening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Thank you, sir, for all this fabulous presentation. And it's, very, so much. it's very informative and uh, very guiding and simplifying at the same time the tough situation. You know, sir, that the cornea, the regular cornea, uh, it's very tough to, to deal with, especially if, you, if you're going to put IL inside the eye. Inside of the eye. Yes. So um, it's a very difficult uh, formula. Uh, and and uh, and we have, as you said, sir, we have to counsel our patient properly, because the re realistic expectation is so far from the work. Yes. You know, you know that uh, you may uh, draw a, a, a pink page or flower for the patient's future, but actually, th this patients will uh, ask you about the results, about the promises. So it's not wise to, 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 to black out. Yes. And at the same time, it's not wise to make it very sunny for them. Uh, yes. And yeah, we, we, we are in. Uh, Agreed. In, yeah. So uh, my first question about the, the, uh, the cataract surgery itself. Uh, the, in Krakonus, I think the endothelial uh, cells not affected or maybe change it in cases with Um We have just published a paper, uh, been accepted today in the DMC about the um, different stages of keratoconus and the type of endothelium in these stages. Yeah, um, they accepted. Yes, so, uh, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, so it seems that there are some changes in the endothelium also in the patients in patients with keratoconus that should be respected in spite of all, all of us know that we are doing dark for these patients because the endothelium is uh, good. But again, it is for my mind, I think, but this is not evidence-based medicine, like the epithelial mapping, which had been found recently that it's correlated to the stage of keratoconus with the heaps of the epithelium in some areas and less epithelium in the other areas. There are some changes in the endothelial um, mapping, not the endothelium characters. It's a healthy endothelium with a normal uh, uh, shape and function, but the condensation of the epithelium in some areas are a little bit different in another area. So, Respect even the endothelium for the patients with catacornas. It's not um, a diseased one, but it's an abnormal one. This is the message to the endothelium of the catacornas. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. You are always in the front. I just, uh, I, I just, I, I just uh, thought, uh, I was thinking just now about the endothelial status in patients with catacornas. But actually, you, you took the idea and published a study about it. Thank you. And congratulations, sir. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, so, if in cases of keratoconus, if there is no uh, the spray or the, the the very early signs of which may lead to the high drops, I, I can uh, consider that the endothelial is just vulnerable or borderline one, not diseased, but not at the same at the same time not healthy or completely normal one. So, I have to study it before going to the surgery. Sure, sure. Specular microscopy is a must yeah. for all cataract patients, even with normal cornea, as you know. I'm doing routinely um, for all my cataract patients now with the IOL master and the lens, as I told you before, I'm doing the um, uh, specular microscopy and even uh, OCT for the optic nerve and the macula, because many times you are facing something that you did not expect, like a macular hole, uh, compromised optic nerve. So the thing that you tell the patient before the surgery, it's an information. But if you tell him after the surgery, it's a, it's a doctor's complication. Yes. So be careful of this. Yes, perfect. perfect, sir. I agree with you, sir, about that. 
uh, but uh, yeah, they are. They have to be a routine uh, investigation prior to surgery. But actually, I want to emphasize on this point: if you if you don't have the facility to do spectral microscopy for all patients, uh, especially the young uh, patients, but if you have a patient with cryogenesis, I have to do even to even I have to send it right. to the okay. That's right. That's absolutely right. Like the pentacam. You have to do again pentacam to know what's the situation of the cornea for uh, uh, patients with irregular cornea and cataracts. Uh, how, how, how can I know uh, this cornea is regular cornea or irregular cornea? Um, of course, simply once you examine the patient on the autorefractometer, you can see the Myers in advanced irregularity. Um, the refraction of the patient, the um, uh, topography, it's a simpler way. And I think the topography is um, cheaper than the Pentacam. And it's the main tool to, um, to know the regularity of the corner or even the manual keratometry if available in the, um, in the place that you work. It's very valuable to know the regularity and the regularity of the corner. Yeah, by Pentacam, okay, we, we, we can, we can uh, have this information, but about the clinic, uh, I'm asking about the sense, your clinical sense after, uh, with your experience, about the, the axis of the astigmatic error, the cylinder in both eyes or, or the same eye, uh, uh, about the, refra the subjective refraction, uh, I, I mean? Yes, yes, yes. Mm. Of course, if you have an irregular astigmatism or simply by the window sign that we are teaching the students, just look to the light and see the window's shadow on the cornea. If it is regular, it could be a regular cornea. If it is irregular, it could be an irregular cornea. And of course, the refraction of the patient having any kind of astigmatism and the patient does not reach one or 0.9, this means this, the, the cornea may have a problem if, there's an, if there is no other problem in the lens or the back of the eye. So astigmatism with patient does not reach one, you have to put in mind that this cornea could be an irregular one. Even in children, I'm ordering routine pentacam for them if they have high astigmatism more than minus three um, to start with and he doesn't um, reach the one um, or six, six uh, vision with their glasses. So how much is the astigmatism? And its axis is a very important clue for the regularity of the corner. Yeah, okay, thank you, sir. Uh, about the, the children with, with high astigmatic error, uh, uh, actually, we, we are doing a study about that, uh, sending all patients for the PINDA camp, and up till now, with, with the, the candidates we are uh, working with, uh, we, we discovered uh, from 30, from 30, <clears throat> from 30 children, we discovered around five with very early crust. Suspected cornea. Suspected cornea. Uh, yes, around yeah, around, that's the, age of, around yes. the age of eight, uh, very early to discover, but it, it, it's very important. Uh, uh, are they emetropes or they are um, with, no. re, with refractive error? With refractive error, sir. Especially the astigmatic. We are sending the astigmatic. Uh, considering the astigmatic, the, the cylindrical error beyond minus 1.5. Especially, uh, as you mentioned, sir, especially if they don't have 2020 by the refraction. Uh, also, we have study with the Farhat Hafizi group and uh, it's called the um, K-MAP, doing um, um, screening for keratoconus, Middle East and all the countries all around the world. And uh, our center was uh, choose to be center from the Middle East and we uploaded up to more than 1,500 um, uh, pentacam for people just to know what's the instance of the um, Keratoconus in Egypt, for example, or for the Middle East, which are expecting to have high incidence. And these were emetropes or with error refraction. And the results are on its way again to be published, but not yet um, approved. So I'm not going to tell the results. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of good news today. So we are proud of, the, of all of that. Uh, and and, and we, we, we may have someday the honor to be uh, one of this group with, with uh, yes. Professor Ahmed al Masih. I'm waiting, so I'm, I'm waiting for. Uh, I hope so. 
closer the 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 the, the this question may lead us to the the next one which is about the toric il as you mentioned yes. your presentation the toric il should be considered if if this patient ha has a good vision all this this good vision will be with the glasses with just the spectacles or, or the hard contact lens you know sir that the hard contact lens will correct the surface astigmatism yes. will, will, will mm -hmm. smoothen it so you you will judge with the hard contact lens or with the spectacles then with the spectacles with the spectacles because the hard contact lens will eliminate the factor of irregularities so it's not we cannot judge on the toric rls with hard contact lens of course yeah. Um, because most of the patients cannot adapt the hard contact lens or the RGPs or the ROSK. But that, again, it's in the pipeline of having um, advanced contact lenses that are more comfortable for patients with regular corneas. But for judging for toric IOLs, are judging with the, just the refraction and the glasses and um, uh, uh, compatibility of the axes on the topography, pentacam, autoreflectometer, and the uh, IL master and the lens star. If all of them are the same, with the same axis, this will be, give you um, um, uh, a clue or a step to discuss with the patient. We may have toric IL, but be very, very cautious because, because again, the results are very unpredictable. Yes, yes, okay. Sir, so, thank you very much uh, about clearing all these points. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the same, I think the same will be with the toric IL, the ICL. In uh, uh, patients with high errors and very young with clear lens, I, I know that you don't like and uh, I'm to, uh, to, to remove the lens or to exchange the, the, the lens of, uh, in, in the younger age, before 40, the age of 40. Uh, but, but about the toric ICL, I, I think the same situation, uh, the same um, uh, conditions uh, uh, to, to consider the toric ICL in cases with keratoconus. Yes, exactly. Um, toric ICLs are a very good tool to correct a large amount of myopia and astigmatism, but again, never ever to promise the patient of free glasses of, um, or no astigmatism at all, because even with the regulation of the irregular cornea, we still have some mild irregularities that for the type A patients, they will need, may need glasses. Honestly, for patients with keratoconus that I'm crossing them and doing rings for them or without rings, and they're asking them for refractive correction and putting ICL for them, mostly I'm using the regular ICLs, not the toric ones. And in the, I'm putting, of course, the ring, the ICL on the steep meridian, depending on the pentacam. And I know that there will be some astigmatism and to reassess the astigmatism after the surgery to see if the patient will need a topo-guided uh, PRK or he doesn't need anything. But again, the toric ICLs, uh, the point of being very expensive and it takes a long time to be um, prepared for the patients who are not now ready to wait for a long time. They need all of the time to be in hurry. So I prefer to do ICL in most of the cases, but I did toric ICLs for uh, patients with keratoconus and regulated cornea after the cross blinking and the rings. Uh, okay, sir, but, but the, the problem will, will stay. H how to judge these, the, the steepest meridian, the steepest axis to choose? Uh, yeah. Yes, the, uh, the steepest axis, uh, because in the preparation of the rings, it's a key point. Um, so um, we are doing the um, pentacam and having the chromatic axis from the Zernike uh, table or Zernike analysis. And on this chromatic axis, we know where is the um, uh, steepest and the flattest axis. And this chromatic, because the highest um, uh, spheric, uh, highest uh, high order abrasion in, in the patient's correspondence is the coma. So and we depend on this axis of the coma, and we know where is the steep axis, mainly from the chromatic axis. In the cases of the rings, we open the place where we insert the rings in the summation of the steep chromatic axis and the flat chromatic axis. 
the summation of those two rings, we open on, uh, we make the incision for insertion of the ring. So for the knowing where is the steep axis, we depend more on the chromatic axis because in most of our discussion, we did not discuss the point of the posterior floats and the posterior astigmatism, which is again, should be respected in these patients. This is the point. Yeah, and the, the, the summation of the anterior and posterior corneal astigmatism to define yes. the amount of astigmatism itself, uh, with, which will be added in the toric ICL or IL. Yes, uh, that's right. Yes, okay. Uh, perfect. Uh, so, sir, about the, axi the axial length of the eye, uh, I, I think it's a very helpful tool to define if you, if you, if this high myopia from the eye itself, from the eye length, or from the corneal hinges. Sure. So, to know if you put ICR or to put the intraocular lens. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, I we, think the most stable thing is the axial length because in the IL master and the lens star, all of the time it is stable, whether it is 22, 23, 24, high myopia or whatever. But the most irregular thing is the K readings. And that's why you find abnormal powers of IRLs like minus 15, minus 17, which is not logic at all. In these cases, as I said in the lecture, please don't put minus seven or minus 10, which is the maximum IOL wait, do just the cataract and reassess the situation after doing the cataract, leaving the patient affected or even put zero lens for him at the time and then tell him that the, your, your surgery will be on steps. This is a very important point for the patient. He should know that it's a difficult surgery, not technically, but for the results. So it could be on steps. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I know that your time is, uh, is very tight in your holiday and you are sacrificing your holiday, I know. Uh, and so much, questions, the questions are endless, but I, I may end with this question about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the correction of the uh, astigmatism after, if you, if you bought intraocular lens in cataract surgery or toric ICL, and you're still having um, a degree of astigmatism, uh, would you consider the, uh, the uh, laser-based correction or to put intraocular ring segment? Again, it depends on the pachymetry and uh, how much is this astigmatism and the regularity of the cornea. If you have a good, uh, if, you, if you have good pachymetry and a small amount of astigmatism, we can do topo guided PRK as long as the cornea is stable and the patient is cross linking. But combined, if you have high, combined with cross linking or 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 not? Yes, combined with cross linking. If the patient is not cross linked, even in old age, got cross linking before. It's okay, no need for cross-linking again. Just yeah. do the topo-guided PRK without cross-linking. If it's already cross-linked. Yeah. There, it's either cross-linked correctly or it's not cross-linked. Yeah, cross-linked, leave it in peace. Excuse me for interruption. No, no, no. But I want to get to pick the points. Uh, 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 there is a limited, uh, limited uh, amount of correction. Or ablation 50 depth. microns. Up Don't up. exceed 50 microns. Mm. This is the point. Yeah, okay. 50 micro is not maximum because and, if you have high amount of ablation, definitely it will affect the corneal regular. Yes, and the cross. Okay. Uh, uh, what, what about the Bentacam you, you may consider, sir, about it in this list of the guided? 500, less than, more than? I, I didn't get the question. Uh, what about the, the cutoff point of pachymetry? Of 460. 400? 460, 460 is the minimum to do PRK. If it is less than 460, don't touch this patient. Uh, this is my cut off line, yes. Even, and I'm not talking about the normal cornea, normal thin cornea, even in this patient with cornus, you will consider uh, 460? Yes, 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 mostly yes. Mostly I respect the cornea too much. I'm so conservative at this point. Yeah, we, you, you are giving the hope for uh, followers. Uh, my, my cutoff point was 500 in such patients, but in 460 in the normal thin cornea, I can do PRK, but in keratoconic cornea, in, um, I, 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 I prefer, yeah, prefer to be higher, to be 500 to, to, uh, uh, <coughs> to, to keep the, the, the biomechanics. But um, I, I will follow on your responsibility, sir.
Sure. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. What about the what about your your opinion in um, in surgeons who are doing uh, femto smile or <clears throat> or laser after implantation of intracorneal ring segment in very weak? You do you agree? Uh, to be honest, the cornea should be respected, and we have rules, even with the advanced technologies and as you know i'm a fan of femto smile maybe the second who did the femto smile in the middle east after dr osama ibrahim and we are doing now femto smile for more than 10 years exactly since 2011 we did thousands of cases of smile and still it's my preferable surgery for the myopes more than minus three or in this uh, range up till the minus eight or even ten but still smile or femto smile is a refractive procedure like like any other refractive procedure it's not allowed to do it in weak corneas it's not allowed not uh, uh, to do it on thin corneas or ectatic corneas or suspect, suspected corneas or patients with um, form frustrated corneas no it's a, it's a exactly like any other lasik procedure which has the advantage of not having a flap not cutting the, the edges of the cornea. And yes, it keeps a little bit the biomechanics, but in a cornea like the keratoconus with a very low biomechanics, definitely the smile will worsen like any other surgery, the weak cornea. So please respect the refractive surgery, doing smile for the indicated cases and doing the regular surgery for the, uh, again, the indicated cases. Don't ever do smile for cases of suspicious corneas. This is a very important message. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for, uh, we, <clears throat> we may end with this golden advice and thank very you, important and crucial message for the refractive sur surgery uh, uh, practitioners. Um, and and we, we have a lot of questions about the cryocornis itself, about the cross-linking. So we may arrange, if, you're, if you have a time in the coming weeks, to, to, to discuss uh, uh, and to, to, uh, to do an open discussion about the cross um, and the cryotoconus uh, issues. Thank you very much, Dr. My pleasure. And, uh, all my uh, 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 gratitude and all my thanking uh, to uh, Professor Ahmed Al-Masri, uh, Professor of Ophthalmology at Alexandria University, the expert and the the, the uh, brilliant teacher in the field of cornea cataract and refractive surgery, and hoping to uh, to have him again in the academy. And with uh, all honor and pleasure, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Hussein, for inviting me. And of course, it will be my pleasure to discuss in another session the uh, any other issue as you, as you would like. And it was my pleasure and honor to be with you in this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.